Hello, today, the Antelope Audio Zen Tour Synergy Core audio interface. Hello, so I gotta admit, this has been a long time coming. I've had this since last November, now it's almost July. Um... I've been dreading to do this review because it's a very complicated one, because it's a very complicated device, and it doesn't necessarily really fit on the channel, except for the fact that this is really a great audio interface for the studio that works with a lot of guitar. You'll find out why. It clocks in at, well, 2000 bucks. So this is a super high-level interface, and we're not even going to talk about stats and dbs and signal to noises and all that stuff a because i don't know and i don't care if i spend this much money it better be freaking top notch and i dare you to hear the difference between this and any ua or audient or any high level interface I, it, this is measurable but who gives a flying rat's ass when you make rock and roll so we're gonna look at other stuff how is it you know in in daily use how is the interface? And we're going to start with the ins and outs, which is where Antelope Audio absolutely rules. This, compared to the Universal Audio, kicks the Universal Audio's ass. I have a Universal Audio Apollo 8, I have an Apollo Twin Quad, and I have an X4 Quad, and I love them. I've worked with them for years, and realistically, I'm so in the Universal Audio uh, environment that it doesn't make sense to replace the universal audio stuff with this. However, I wish I could replace a lot of the features from the UA with the features from this. So, ins and outs on the UA are rather limited for the price. Good converters and all that stuff, and of course the built-in plugin platform, which this kind of does have as well. But, on the Zen 2 Synergy Core, we got four XLR inputs. On the front, we got, haha, four high Z inputs, which can also be lined. So that gives it eight inputs right there for my priest and four high Z inputs, meaning you could, for a metal session where you're probably going to do reamping and all that stuff anyway, go in with guitar number one, guitar number two, and bass and track DI for all three at the same time. While you're tracking the DI for two guitars and a bass, you can go out of two reamp outs, meaning high Z impedance correct outputs to your amp, track that as well but you're tracking the DI and the amp at the same time, and the bass is good DI, if you ask me. And then there's a fourth one for line or whatever. So that is already phenomenal. Two headphone outs, two reamp outs, which the UA has none of. You need a reamp box. Four high Z inputs, which can be switched to line. On the back, this is Thunderbolt 3. Three kick ass, that's how it should be. But it also has USB, which means it absolutely is compatible with older computers. Um, and there's no uh, uh, negative side effect of using USB. So USB and Thunderbolt, meaning it's fully compatible with any newest Mac, it's fully compatible with any PC. That is kick ass. When you buy a UA interface, you better have a Mac because they don't really support PC all that well. Shows you based on the, um, knowing that the Luna uh, recording DAW thing is uh, only uh, Mac. ADAT in and out. So that gives you another eight ins and eight outs with light pipe. SPDIF, SPDIF in and out. Now, because there is the coaxial SPDIF, the ADAT is not switchable to light pipe SPDIF, which I really find sad, because that's my preferred mode to uh, hook up my aux from Universal Audio. So it has the full coaxial in and out for SPDIF. It has the full ADAT in and out, um, stereo out for monitors, and then there's eight individual outputs with D sub, which you have to buy the cable, which I did. 50 bucks for the cable. I think this is a, oh, it's a Hosa cable. Hosa, great company. I bought this, didn't get it from Hosa, but uh, that was about 49 bucks at Toman, and I bought this so I can get the full use out of my Synergy Core. 
as a rather small interface that you probably could throw into a laptop bag if you wanted to, this is fully freaking featured. With an eight mic pre going into with ADAT that gives you 12 mic inputs. And if you had another four mic pre, you could actually go in line in the front that gives you 16 mic inputs if you so desire. Has a touch screen, uh, built in talkback, all that stuff. Now let's talk about the power that it has with its Synergy Core. It comes with a bunch of plugins and you can buy more. And the there's compress there's all the like vintage compressors, the vintage EQs, uh, there's guitar amps, there's cabs, guitar effects. It's all killer. However, you can't use them yet, that might be coming, as easily uh, like a plugin in your DAW, and then it's you're running it on here, like with the UA platform. If you want to do that, you actually have to route out of your DAW to an external effect, route it in here, and then back into your DAW, and when you're mixing down, have to do a real-time uh, mix. And you can route out of your DAW 24 channels and back into 24. So it is pretty powerful, but realistically, those built-in effects, I would see them as pre-effects for tracking, uh, doing a limiter on a track, doing EQ on a track, doing a mic pre on a track. If you have the antelope microphones, there's also microphone modeling that you can do, but you have to have one of those antelope microphones. So as an interface, the ins and outs are phenomenal and I think are as good as it gets compared to the competition that I know. Very, very high-end preamps, very high-end converters. We don't have to talk about that. If it's not, ha not high-end at that price point, then someone's doing something wrong. We're going to look at what do those amps sound like. We're going to do a little bit of tracking a DI track. Um, we're not going to do actual reamping. I've tried it. There wasn't... I, the, I had one unit and the reamp out just never sounded like the guitar into the amp. It just didn't even have the level. It, it was way too low. And we played around with it for days and we found out uh, it's probably a hardware uh, problem, which I didn't think it was. I sent it back. They sent me a new one. And uh, lo and behold, it was a hardware problem. Now, recording DI and then playing DI back through the reamp out actually was exactly the same level, exactly the same dynamics and everything that the guitar was directly into the amp. That was very important for me. Otherwise, I would not have wanted to push this if actually it wasn't the right thing. You want to know that your guitar going into the amp is exactly the same thing as the reamp going into the amp. And that is the case. So I'm not showing this in this video, but that is the case. I tried it. I'm not showing it because the sequences I have run in 48. And when I'm using the aux, which I use uh, on digital, it only does 44.1. And this doesn't do sample rate conversion the UA X4 does sample rate conversion. So whether I'm pumping, so it's 44.1 coming in, but my sequence is 48, the X4 will take care of this. This does not. So if you're running an aux A, make sure you're running it coaxial spdiff and that your sequences are in 44 because the aux only does 44. Okay, that's, that's a drawback and that's why we're not doing that. Let's start with a, the guitar sounds. Let's do that. Thank you. 
For demo and that's all good for tracking the guitars while uh, you're doing DI and then it gets reamped later. Is it something you necessarily want to keep on your final recording? I have, you know, I have kick-ass amps. No. Uh, if you don't have access to kick-ass amps, you can absolutely do great music with that. I tracked albums with a part two and it's nobody bitched about the guitar sound, so these are way better than a part two. So if you're doing great music, this is absolutely fine. Let's look at the phenomenal routing capabilities. They will drive you insane, but they're also very, very good. And here we are. I'm going to show you, first of all, the routing matrix. So you open up the antelope launcher. It's a little bit of a pain in the ass, but that is where you see your different devices um, and where you update and all that, which I've just done. Then you hit the launch, uh, the start control panel. You can also auto run that and then it loads. And then it loads. Here it is. So calling up the console quickly, not gonna happen. Technically, here's the mixer. Well, which of the mixers? Well, there's a couple. The interface is extremely cumbersome and confusing, but let's make it easy. On top here, you see the monitor, which you can see. Oh no, that's headphone volume. Hmm. But I hit headphone gain. Uh, line out volume, monitor volume. And then you can see that actually also does something in the software. How are you hearing me, by the way? Well, because I can't record in Cubase because I'm showing you an audio interface. I'm actually routing myself, I'm going with a shotgun mic right there into the Zentur Synergy Core on, as you can see right here, channel one. And uh, I'm rerouting that out of this D sub which is the eight uh, individual outs, the line outs, and I'm recording in a Zoom recorder right here. And I just had the hardest time actually getting a distortion-free level happening. Uh, seems to be because of the line out volume of the Zen Tour, which we'll get to. So you can dim, you can mute, you can do all of these things here as well. You can mute right here and the touch screen is your friend. What did I just do? Line out, reamp volume, and there you can mute. This little antelope thing is the talkback. Well, we get to that actually when I show you the interface. Ah, oh, the talkback. You can see you can say which uh, preamp you want for the talkback, uh, where it goes, 
me, as you can see, also there. So if I do this, it's on. Okay. Um, and here you've got the headphone volumes also with mute and all that stuff. Everything you can also do on the actual device. Up here, we've got the internal sample rate, which I can't change right now because Cubase is open in the background and it's telling it we're at 48. Um, clock source, I also can change. I have it connected with USB, not with Thunderbolt, and that's a great thing about the device. It does both. In terms of connectivity, this thing freaking rocks. So here's my mixer. And one thing you're going to notice on the mix, so A, there is a reverb on top of here, which cannot be recorded. Uh, that is purely a in-the-mixer kind of monitoring reverb. So we could also just turn that off. And there are four different mixers, which is great because they have an output, and you can assign that output to anything. You can say mixer 1 is my main mix. Mixer 2 is headphone 1, mixer 3 is headphone 2, mixer 4 goes out of individual outs of the line outs to something else appear, whatever. You really can have four completely independent mixes. So in mixer 1, what you're going to see, and that is one of the confusing things, there's the guitar input 1, 2, 3, 4, mic 1, 2, 3, 4, which is fine, pre-routed to the mixer. Here I've got my CBL and CBR, that is Cubase left and Cubase right, so it's a virtual out. But then I've got the guitars out, guitar outs again, and then I've got the mics again. Those should be empty, Antelope, because I have things on there twice, which can be quite annoying. Another thing, you will see levels down here. So if I play Cubase, But you might have noticed, first of all, I, ha I have these linked, which makes sense. Very easy to link stereo. Very obvious. There's mute. There's solo. Uh, there's a send for this reverb. The master doesn't have a level. You can't see the level on the master. And so therefore, you don't actually know whether you've got audio on the master. And I've had problems actually getting audio out of the damn thing. Um, would help to see if there's level on the master. Of course, there's another page where you can see levels. Um, we'll get to that. Down here, you can zoom or scroll through the mixer, which has 32 outputs. So where you would see that the master carries level is at meters. Right now, I can see the preamps. You can see I'm talking and um, I route it out of one and in mic one, so it, it shows up twice. The emulated mics, yes, if you have an antelope mic, you can have that um, uh, emulated and it does different kind of mics. Comp play is what the computer is playing right now. That would be the Mac, that would be Cubase. ADAT in, SPDIF in, AFX out, which is actually what's coming out from their built-in effects rack. And then here's the actual mixer. So... However, why in the world wouldn't that light up here? You re I mean, look, this is a great, great interface when you're willing to fight with the interface. They need an interface designer very badly. It is so close to not being usable um, that it flabbergasts me. I know it has a lot of options, but I'm fighting with it every time. So up here we have preferences. Line out trim, which I had to get down to 14 uh, dBU. I wish I could actually get that down lower because I'm still, I'm had problems with distortion in the zoom. Um, line out. Is it the main? Also, is this on or is this off? I actually think this might be off. I don't know and I don't remember. And I had trouble with that stuff. Reamp volume, you definitely want to zero. 
because you want to make sure whatever you're recording is actually the exact level of what you were giving in. You know, playing a guitar and you want it to go into your amp exactly the way that it would go into the amp as if you plug directly into it. Um, he set the oscillator, kilohertz and level and all that, which is cool because if you want to just check something, you can put an oscillator in the slot, send it to any output and then you hear, ah, there's a sound. So for testing, that's actually very good. But let's get to it. Here is the routing. It's an amazing page. It is amazing what you can do, and it is also amazingly frustrating. Got a nice bubble there that I photographed. So here we go. This is the input. This is the output. Imagine they were smart enough to write sources and destinations. It would solve a lot of problems because it isn't output. These are where things go. Now, when something goes to something, it is actually an input, okay? So, the comp record is actually not an output. It is the input to the computer. And the comp play is actually not an input. It is actually an output. Something is coming from it. So, sources and destinations. Imagine you could change this input to sources and output to destinations. All of a sudden, everything makes a lot more sense. We have the four different high Z inputs, which by the way, you can switch to line. So you can go in line with the keyboard, not a problem. It doesn't have to be a guitar or a bass. Then there are the ADAT inputs and the SPDIF inputs. So the inputs you see on top and here on the preamp, you can see you can even link them together, 48, phase reverse, and when you click on here, that's for their mic emulation if you have a mic from Antelope. So we got the four inputs which are on the front of the device right here. Mic inputs which are on the back. Emulated mic, we don't have that, I don't have a mic from them. And then there's comp play, which means those are outputs. Well, they accept inputs from software. So. One and two is my max audio. So I don't want to interfere with that. I don't want Cubase to be the same thing. So in Cubase, I'm actually sending two, three, and four. And I renamed that to Cubase left and Cubase right. Just double click on it and rename it. So let me show you in Cubase, my control room out, which is my main out in Cubase, is going to Zen Tour three and four. And you see all 24. Send to a SC USB outputs. Of course, you don't see how they were renamed, but still, you can absolutely work with that. So three and four is my Cubase output, which I can now take and put anywhere. I can put it anywhere on the mixer. I could put my Cubase output directly onto the monitor out, which I don't want. I want to be able to control it. So right now, it's on mixer one right there. Let's get rid of the other mixers for now. I just don't see them, okay? Let's get rid of this AFX. So right now on the mixer, you can see what's, well, it's here and it's here. So it shows up twice on the mixer. Is that a smart idea? I don't know. But let's say I'm assigning six and seven, no, seven and eight. So you literally just take this and drag it on there. And now seven and eight is showing up on the mixer. And over here, we're gonna do 23 and 24. So if I want Cubase to show up right here on the mixer, I take my comp play three and four, drag it on there. And now that's where it shows up on the mixer right here, linked together. And I have control over my Cubase output. And that master, mix one left, right, or well, technically that's an output, right? Why does it show up on input? That's what's so confusing, but it is a source. So the source, mixer output, mixer one left, mixer one right. That's what I named it. Where's that going? That's going to my monitor output right there. If you wanted mixer two as a sub headphone mix, all you would do is take mixer two and assign it to headphone one. Headphone two is getting directly what's coming out of the Mac right now. It could literally get 
anything. Okay, I could take Cubase, put it there. I could put a different mix in Cubase if I wanted that and drag it over here, assign it to 9 and 10. You're starting to get the idea. My ADAT in, right now it doesn't show up at all on the mixer. Well, I want to change that. Can I do this? Oh, look at that. Oh, out of my ADAT out, or ADAT inputs, bam, show up on my mixer one now. Right there are the ADAT ins. Super simple. Great thing is, whatever you're doing there can actually become a preset. You can see right here, there are presets. So let's go to session, hardware preset one, HP42, save. And now it's save. Let's see what happens. Oh, there actually isn't a preset two. So let's take these eight down here. Let's take, let's, let's go crazy. Let's take these eight here. And let's say for my monitor, I'm actually taking mixer four for my monitor. Bad idea. And there wasn't a quick way to go. Oh, monitor, hello, monitor, monitor. When you're on talkback, you can't click on these. That's not annoying at all. There we go. So let's save that. HP 43, <laughs> save. So technically now I can go to preset one, press here to confirm. And you can see that's my routing preset one. So you can have a routing preset for tracking. You can have a complete different routing preset for making videos. You can have a complete routing preset for mixing. You can have a complete routing preset for reamping. So that is actually really cool. So I can go to two, confirm, bam. My complete routing just changed, but I go back and bam, my routing is back. That's great. So these things, these 24 come from the computer and I can assign them anywhere. Just like comp record is what actually I'm pumping into, let's say Cubase in that, uh, in this instance. So right now, mic one right here, let me show you. Mic one, I dragged onto input three, right there. In Cubase, right here, my U6176 is input three, which I've assigned to this track. And now if I record on there, I'm actually getting level. You can see I'm recording there, totally simple. Um, and you really just assign what you want on the 24 different inputs. You can say, um, it's my ADAT, it's my mic, it's whatever you want, you just assign to those inputs. You get that? So that is down here. So uh, seven and eight would be the input from my aux, which would be connected with SPDIF. At the moment I can't use that because my session is 48. The aux only outputs 44 on the SPDIF and the Zen 2 does not do sample rate convert. My universal audio X4 does sample rate convert. So it doesn't matter if I'm in a 44 or 48 session, it'll just convert and the aux works. If you're working with the aux, which only outputs 44.1 digitally, you have to work in a 44.1 session, which right now I'm not. So um, the reamp are two outputs. And right now, if I plug in a guitar into guitar one, it automatically goes through to reamp one and I can listen to my amp, but also at the same time record it. What are these AFX outs and AFX in? Well, that's going into their built-in plugins. So I can say I want my mic in one and that's going into, where's AFX? Here. Oh, it's already going there. Okay, but let's say I don't want mic in one, I want ADAT. What's coming in through my ADAT, I want that on AFX. So I'm just putting that there. And that would be number nine. So let's say something is coming in. So we go to AFX right here, a rec pops up with a lot of 32, 32 inputs. 
So right now, on input nine, right here, it's telling me it's eight at in, so it knows what the input is. And I can put an amp on there if I wanted that. Uh, you can use any of their presets, but special processing, whatever that is. Some of these you have to buy, some of these are included. So right here, oh, apparently everything works now, what? So I can put a vintage EQ on there, bam, I can EQ what's coming in with eight at one. I can oh, well, add one, add effect, compressor, a 160, you know, the classic stuff. You can technically use those from, here we go. You can technically use those within your DAW, but you kind of have to use them as external effects. So the way this has to go is, I will have to assign an external effect in Cubase to, let's say, number nine. Then from number nine, it goes into AFX nine, or AFX, let's say nine. Then the output from the AFX, which is right here, will go into the input of Cubase. So let's say here. And then that's what you're recording. So you're pretty much sending it to the Zen Tour, getting it from the Zen Tour back into Cubase. And then when you're done and you want to do the processing, you actually have to do real time processing as if you have external gear. Is that worth it considering that you can get plugins that do the same thing? I would personally would say no. So it's nice that they have this built in AFX rack that can do all this, but I would rather see that as a tracking mechanism. When you're tracking, put your guitar or your mic through that and then record it. That's really what I would do. Um, vintage mic preamps, let's say that you have more. You can add more and more and can, can build an um, effects rack. And obviously there's also amps, which I have made a little video for you already. So this is very, very cool. Routing. I have eight ADAT outs, eight ADATs in. I have four mic ins, four high Z inputs that can also be lines to an overall of eight inputs. Uh, and then with ADAT, that's 16 inputs. And then you actually have with this D sub cable, which I bought uh, to XLR, you've got eight line outs, which are right here. And that's actually how I'm recording my voice right now. So, very, very impressive routing capabilities. To understand it, I had to have sessions with their tech support, uh, with my contact there, he had to explain it to me. My prediction is when you get this, you won't get a sound out of it. It is extremely complicated to operate. And every time I get to it, I have to work with the, it, it, the, the learning curve is massive. I think this should be quite a bit better. You have, however, the matrix. And that is even more complicated. So you do have a routing matrix here. Don't even ask me what we're looking at. The preamp is going to... Yeah, I don't know. So yeah, you can look at it in that matrix. Then again, you have the meters, which you can display. So where are the line outs? Line outs, line out, line out. Bam. So right now you also see that mirrored right here. Um, it's all nice. It's all super high end and it's great. But with great options comes great option paralysis. And that is exactly what this does. It's exactly what this does. Where are my meters? I feel hardware is there. Interface needs to be improved. So let's Yeah, you can see mindfuck. One of the problems of the thing, it can do so much, but it also, it takes a while to get to it doing that. Trust me, this is not a thing you get and you start recording on day one. Probably not even on day two. You wanna learn it before you get a band in the studio. Let's look at what you can do on the interface. So here we are, it's, it's relatively straightforward. Gain cycles through the different inputs. Okay, you can also 
tab here to get to the different inputs. Um, headphone volume. If you want to get to monitor, you can say what the line out volume is, the reamp volume, the monitor volume, or you just go to monitor line headphone. However, when you're here, which is talkback, and now I can turn the talkback on and off for the different outputs, um, you can click on them. It's a little bit, I don't understand. So instead of internal, it's telling you it's internal, I can't change it. There's also, there's also a menu here to actually do a lot. Uh, brightness, uh, come interface. You can do a lot on this thing, what the antelope button does. Whether it's talkback, uh, does mono, whether it's a dim button. So this is actually configurable in certain ways. Um, you can all, and you have the presets, which is pretty damn cool to be able to switch presets right here for the routing. So make yourself a couple of different options. And then, and actually, they, they work in standalone as well. So you don't need to have it hooked up to a computer. What really bugs me is there is no power switch. Why do they make devices that have no power switch? It really, really, really bugs me. Well, when you click on power, you can actually power it off. I can't do that right now, otherwise you don't hear me anymore because my mic is plugged in right there. But that is an option. You can power it off on the touchscreen, and then when you power it on, actually power it on with a uh, with the touchscreen again. However, why don't you just give me a hardware switch? I mean, really, just let me turn the damn thing off. Is that so hard? And that's pretty much what you can do right here. And it's nice that it has a touchscreen. It's definitely uh, better than, than the UA stuff where you, without software, you can't do anything. Again, the touchscreen is great, but also something you want to get your head around. It's it, Intuitive is not antelope strong suit. Let's look at uh, recording some DI and what you have to do in terms of routing to make that happen. So let's do a DI recording session where I also record uh, the simulated amp. You could obviously also go out of the interface at the same time through the reamp out and record the real amp. However, I have a feeling that that's not the ideal thing because something happens with impedance and it's not really the same thing as pumping the guitar directly into the amp. It is, however, an option and it's an easy option because the routing is already set up for that. G1, which is guitar input one, is going directly to reamp one. So let's find out how we would set that up. You have to really wrap your head around. So my guitar is coming in, as we can see right there on the high Z input. Um, but we can't necessarily hear that right now because let's see, how do you hear what I'm doing, because right now the Cubase output is routed to three and four. So what we have to do is the mixer output will have to be routed to three and four. So we're gonna do, let's do mixer two, is now routed to three and four, which means you wouldn't hear Cubase, unless, I'm turning on mixer two right here, we're gonna put Cubase right here on one and two. Come on. Also, when you, by the way, click, right click on any of these, you can mute it, you can mute the whole row, or you can turn an oscillator on to troubleshoot stuff, which is very cool. So, um, we want to hear this guitar thing. So now, that's rather loud. And I don't hear mixer two. Make sure we definitely don't want the mic. Otherwise, we have feedback issues. So you'd best be well served by just muting everything right from the get go. Or just not muting or just getting rid of everything in the mix and just completely uh, setting that to, to nothing. Um, so I want to hear that now. And so on the monitor, I'm actually putting mixer two. Why? Hello, hello, ah, okay. 
Now I should be able to route mixer 2 to the monitor. Now I can hear it. And that's literally just my, my dry guitar. And it's way too loud. And it's, uh, well, it's to the left. So I'm going to the mixer. G1, center, good. So that's what I want to record, but I don't really necessarily want to hear that, right? So I'm going to take G1 into the AFX. Where is it? AFX in. Oh, it's already on one. See, G1 is already going to AFX in one. And on AFX in one, I just... Uh, on my mixer, I'm muting this. So the, the DI I don't hear anymore. I know it's there. So on four, I'm taking AFX one out, which is my amped guitar. And that now shows up and I can name that Git and now it's Git. So I go back to my AFX. No, I go back to my mixer. Boy, this is confusing. And there it says Git. Putting this in the middle. Of course, we can have that in stereo, but let's not. That is way too loud. Let's do something that's more, more rock and roll, okay? These faders are not very linear. Gotta learn the part. Something along those lines, okay? So now I can record that onto my Zoom recorder because it is going out of line out. I have the AX on the mixer. I have the, that guitar on the mixer and I have the DI on the mixer, but muted. Yet I cannot record it. So I have to take the Git and actually put it into comp record. So it would be on one. Okay, it's there. And the DI, let's do it the other way around. So we're going to take the DI, which would literally be the G1. Going to take that to comp record. And then the Git to comp record two. So now I'm going into the Cubase. Can you still follow me? So we're going to call this Git DI. Make a new bus. Mono git sim, which of course could also be the real amp if you plugged it into a mic or into, uh, you know, um, uh, Spdiff or whatever, it's, if it's simulated. So we have the git sim. So the git di would be one and the git sim would be two. There we go. Now I'll simply make here some guitar tracks. I will mute these. I'll add two tracks, not stereo, mono, electric guitar DI, and electric guitar sim. Gonna make these a different color. So on the mixer, the DI is getting the DI, and the sim is getting the sim input. Technically, that's what should be happening now. And we're gonna test that. Again, follow me. I took the G1, the, so the direct guitar input, and I'm sending that into comp record one. That's going into Cubase or whatever you want. And I'm taking the G1 into the AFX in, where I put an amp on it. I'm taking that AFX out 
on one into Cubase 2 right here on Comp Record. You can see why this is complicated. But technically, if I record both, I should have a simulation, so I kind of know what, I, what I'm playing with a real sound or a simulated sound. And I have the DI for reamping. Looks correct to me. Absolutely. Level up here a little bit. And then... So, great! So if I record that, I actually have a DI signal and the simulation to actually hear kind of what it's supposed to sound before it goes to an engineer that's reamping it. You, again, you could also, instead of the simulation, send it out of the uh, device again, out of the Zentour into your amp and mic that at the same time while you're recording the DI. Damn it! <laughs> So I'm not sure about the input levels here. and so on, and so on. There's a sound, it's not horrible at all, it's totally usable for the, the demo thing, and then of course you have the DI right there, and so on, uh, to use later for reamping. So. Again, wrapping your head around the routing is the key here. And um, once you've done it, make it a preset. And then on your interface, I'm pointing, you can't see it. On your interface, you can actually just go to that uh, DI slash guitar recording preset and you're good to go. So once you set up the presets, you might even want to forget about the whole routing possibilities. See, totally cool, totally doable. And um, if you are into recording DI stuff, which apparently every metal band does now, so reamping can happen, um, then this is the freaking solution. I think we've covered it all. Actually, we haven't. We probably covered only the tip of the iceberg. So let's talk about what I think. I am utterly impressed by the routing of this thing. The UA stuff doesn't in any way allow for even a sliver of that routing. It really annoys me how incredibly limited the routing on the UA stuff is. But given the routing on this and how phenomenal it is with the reamp out and getting this in in line or uh, high Z and then taking and then with the D sub and route it out of ADAT if you want, everything is freaking possible. But the interface is absolutely ghastly. They need to, to scrap it, throw away the software antelope and start over. I have talked to other channels that have one of these and we all pretty much think the same thing. So um, it is a major drawback for me to put this on the table because it feels like a pain to operate it. Once you wrap your head around it, this can do stuff that I don't know any other audio interface is capable of. I mean, there, some might be, but I think it's phenomenal. Now the built-in plugins, that's all great. Having to reroute off your door and back into it for me is a no-go. I don't want this too complicated for me, but having them for tracking is cool. Being able to get a Neve style EQ or compressor track with it, uh, tracking the guitar stuff, 
um, uh, doing some cool stuff like this. I think it's it's cool. Do I need the processing in here for that? Realistically, I haven't really run a big session, which I can probably handle. I don't want to talk about stuff I haven't really done, and I haven't done that. But I think it can probably do it uh, going in with ADAT uh, for, from drums from a, an 8 pre um, and actually doing compression and doing pre-processing. Uh, Why not? No sample rate conversion for me is a problem, given that I use the aux. I, it's a love-hate relationship. It's extremely powerful. The interface is extremely frustrating. If you are not afraid of learning and you're not afraid of making mistakes, if you're not afraid of sitting and not getting audio at all for an hour, which trust me, that happened to me, um, whether I was trying reamping or I was trying just getting audio on the master, why in the world isn't there uh, a level on the master, uh, just a graphic, why isn't there a meter on the master? That's what I mean. It's just you yell at that interface so much. But if that doesn't fr it does that doesn't scare you. If you need a lot of in and out, and you need the capability of sending it wherever the fuck you want for individual mixes that you can send out of any output, even spdiff, whatever, this is a great interface. Great preamps, great stats and all that stuff. Usability is questionable. When you're there, it's all good. Features? Ridiculous. This and a laptop, if your laptop goes up in smoke and there's only a computer with USB, good to go. Have a Thunderbolt interface on your computer, have this with, uh, with USB, that's how I did it, good to go. Very, very impressive piece of kit that needs an overhaul on the software that you're using. That's all I'm saying. I'm not getting paid. I get to keep this. Which again, love-hate relationship, but I like the ability to have, I, I like the idea that I have an interface that can do the stuff that my UA stuff can't. And this most certainly can do the stuff that my UA stuff can't. Thanks, uh, Antelope, for commissioning this video. I'm sorry it took so freaking long to do, but your software is also a freaking pain in the ass. <laughs> I put links below. Um, I hope this helped you guys if you were in the market for this. It's worth checking out, trust me. And um, I'll put some animals at the end.